the hardware startup is definitely not for the weak hearted. It takes time. Uh, so if you look at the NASDAQ or stock market and look at the top technology valued company, I think out of like top five, four are hardware startups. So yes, hardware startups are hard, but if you can build something amazing, then you can really build an extremely valuable. I'm Navneet Dalal. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Matic. Hi, I'm Mehul. I'm a co-founder of Matic and I focus on the product. We're a consumer robotics company. Our first product is a floor cleaning robot. It has taken us a long time in six years to make it happen. We at Matic have raised $30 million and our investors are like you know, John and Patrick Collison, Matt Rogers, like Jack Dorsey and like Naval Ravikant. Why do a hardware startup? Why not go do software? One of the things we realized back in 2017 when we have left Google and we were thinking of what do we want to work on? Honest way of saying is that we wanted to do life's work and we wanted to work on the one key aspect which is missing in the society for next 20, 30 years. I think it, it just boils down to solve your own problem. That's one of the things. I had gotten golden retriever. We have a joke that my golden retriever sheds twice a year, six months each. I got a robot vacuum and I actually ended up buying Dyson's version of the robot. And turns out Dyson's version was really bad as well. So the suction part of it is amazing, but vision part of it was really bad where it couldn't find its dog or it got onto one of the nice rugs and it rug shed. But because it has a high suction, it got stuck on it. And when we came home and picked it up, the entire patch of the rug was gone. So here's a $1,000 device that ruined our $2,000 rug and I couldn't return it. So we knew there was a problem here. No one was solving it. Back then, 2016, 2017, self-driving was the space to go in. Imagine trying to build self-driving cars without Google Maps or GPS. And the answer is no matter how smart the car is, if it doesn't know where the road is going or where it's located, it's kind of useless. In the same exact way, if a robot is supposed to clean, it has to know whether it's on the right side of the table or left side of the table and that didn't exist so we thought there was a huge opportunity and floor cleaning was funny because this is the only robots accepted in our home even today yet the category is growing 25 percent year over year so the problem is so intense that we are willing to tolerate inferior product so we asked ourselves this question that if we can build level five fully autonomous robot for indoor spaces what does that mean well if level 5 self-driving car drives like a human, then level 5 indoor robots must behave like a human and clean like a human. So why don't these robots constantly patrol over home, look for dirty spots, and if they find it, they should just clean it. If they're truly intelligent, then they should understand that this is rug, this is a hard surface, that there is a wine stain, and change their efficacy method because we as humans know they're on rugs with frills. If we take a vacuum, it will get stuck, so we don't do that. But if it's a hard surface with wine stain, we need mopping. So robots should be able to adjust the efficacy method similarly as well. But then most importantly, we realize that today's robots and most of the robots don't have a concept of memory. If you start a robot, it will clean for 15 minutes. If you pick it up, put it back on the dock and start again, it cleans the same stupid idea for another 15 minutes. So little things like that where we questioned everything. Why is the brush roll designed that way? Why is mopping designed that way? You know, why are there small wheels and not big wheels? And that was the journey that you question everything. You come back and then you build a system, put it back together at a very first, from a very first principles level. It was just a proof of concept. It was just like, hey, can we just do this with camera, just like Tesla. The reason cameras alone were a really important piece of the puzzle, that a single sensor you add in a hardware, you have to assume there are three software engineers on a flip side making sense of that sensor. So the more sensors you have, the bigger the software team. More sensors you have, the more calibration. More sensors, the more failure points. Each sensor complexity rises exponentially. Our point of view was that, hey, nature has given us two RGB cameras and algorithms for a reason. We don't have tons of sensors. We only have five. And we just primarily rely on vision. So the there has to be a way to get it done. And this is where we thought that let's absorb everything into the software instead of hardware. And that's a much scalable platform over the long term. So that's how we started. What? Jupiter. Yeah. Okay. Clean this. So the depth in we didn't have 3D printers back then. And we built a hardwood shell in some sense. We took an existing Makita vacuum cleaner and put its motor in and then put the cleaning head and attached a stereo camera with the sender Wi-Fi across the Wi-Fi, send the images to a laptop and does all the algorithms on the laptop and then send the results back on it. That was the first prototype. Within three months after that, we migrated it to this tall black robot and we built two of these so we called them Batman and Robin but we thought that hey there would be a hose on the top that you can just also clean around you can ask for the robot to come to you and you can clean around it and put it back and we later realized that if we are doing a very good job of the floor cleaning maybe people can just push the dirt on the ground and let it do it and it will allow us to build a much simpler product we put in about million and a half dollars 
during the bootstrap stage of our own money. But luckily, when you start a company, sometimes the luck helps you. For us, one of that trend was that 3D printers were getting really ubiquitous. So if we had to go and use someone else's machine to build parts, that would have been hard. But because of 3D printers, we were able to shrink that down. But yeah, but overall, we built about 200 plus prototypes and all those are not going to be part of the production unit. So you can say all of them along the way destroyed in some sense. We have been working together since 2006. When I was at Like.com, Mehul also joined Like.com when we were doing computer vision for the Google Photos like a product, but back in 2006. So Like.com was the first computer vision startup. No need did his PhD in there. I didn't know anything about it. So for me, it was very serendipitous that I got to Like.com, just fell in love with everything computer vision. And I was doing most of my work on product marketing business side of things. And the funny story is that I would go, as we were recruiting, I would go and tell other computer vision actors experts that, hey, my co-founder and CEO is Noni Dalal, and he has this PhD thesis and histogram of oriented gradients. And they're like, whoa, your co-founder is Dr. Dalal? And I would always say, wait, who's Dr. Dalal? For him, for us, it was just Navneet. So Navneet never shared that his PhD thesis was really popular, and he was very well known in the computer vision community. Uh, so that was a good revelation. But that's how we started working together, and that's when we connected. Flutter, to be honest, was very geeky thing. The idea was you use the cameras in the laptop, the front-facing cameras, and you can control this laptop when watching a YouTube, Netflix, or listening to a song on a Spotify by just saying play and pause. When we built the technology, a lot of people actually believe it couldn't be done back then because we were just a single small laptop camera. There are not that many computes in 2011 laptops and how can you even run it in a live product? Very soon realized that we are solving a living room problem, which is this is a product which should sit up in your setup box. This is also a time when Microsoft Connect was very popular and it could come out and Nintendo Wii was very popular. So part of the thesis was whenever people do gestures, they turn your finger or hand into a mouse. That's a point and click metaphor we invented. That's not intuitive. So the whole idea was if you want to mute a TV, why can't you just shush it? So that was the insight. And when we launched this app to allow users to control iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Netflix, using Mac, it was number one app in 73 different countries worldwide on a Mac app store for about three months. We had all together 77 million and gestures perform. So technology-wise, it was really great. But we were also part of Y Combinator back then with Flutter. And the entire time we were there, Paul Graham was still working at Y Combinator actively. And he would just come in to us and look at us and says, hmm, I know you guys. You guys are a technology looking for a problem to solve. Have you found one yet? And he would repeat that over and over again. And initially, it was very hard feedback to take. But over time, we realized that, hey, no one wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm going to buy gestures. That that as a product isn't there. It's a really nice feature. It's a really nice technology, but it's not necessarily a product. And that's where it being part of Google or Apple or Samsung or some other platform made more sense. And luckily for us, Apple and Google were both interested in acquisition and we ended up getting uh, acquired by Google. I feel like we were honestly very, very naive the first time. Acquisition definitely allowed us to feel like we can build anything. The technology part of it got right. But we took a year, at least a year, first year, just analyzing what we got wrong. And one of them was this realization that, hey, no one wakes up in the morning, say stray, which is we, we weren't solving a real problem. It was really, really cool technology, but it wasn't a problem. Number two, as Navneet mentioned, hardware, we only solved the problem one thing. So because we were using cameras inside your MacBook, we didn't have access to frame rates per second. We didn't have access to auto exposure or, or autofocus. So that means you're building an algorithm for an eye that is wavered. And that didn't make sense. So we felt like we built a half solution. If you really want to go solve a problem, we have to do hardware as well as software because product can't be limited arbitrarily by, oh, it's software or it's only hardware. That understanding was the reason why we ended up at Nest to learn how to do hardware. So it was very deliberate move on both of our part. And that was really the mindset that like solve a problem, number two, build a product and make sure there is a clear cut revenue model model on day one so that when you go start a company again, these are all problems that you're not thinking about after the fact. Hardware startup is definitely not for the weak hearted. It takes time. But if you are passionate about the problem and if you want to solve it, absolutely. The best way to say this is if you look at the top technology companies today from SpaceX to Tesla to NVIDIA, these are all truly our companies and these are all hardware. And they're actually very, very hard to beat. Uh, so if you look at the NASDAQ or stock market and look at the top technology valued company, I think out of like top five, four are hardware startups. So yes, hardware startups are hard, but if you can build something amazing, then you can really build an extremely valuable. Also add that you got to be a lot more patient and uh, ask 
the three whys in a row, like, you know, why X, Y, Z thing is done in that specific manner. This is really the fundamental reason why it needs to happen that way. Another key piece is in a hardware, at least to our perspective is because startups are inherently risky. You want to reduce your risk as quickly as you can. You can use the same metaphor, like, hey, what part is the most risky part in it? And can they answer or find a solution to that most risky part as soon as you can? And at least in Valley, it doesn't feel like that. But most of us think that, oh, building technology is the risky. That is indeed risky. But at least as a team or founders, you control it. We tend to think the most risky part is the market risk. Is there a market? Is there a customers who are really interested in buying the product or not? At the scale, you need to sell it to be a profitable business because without a profitability, your business will die. And along with it, all the dreams and aspirations of the future world. If you have a problem and if you can solve it just using software, then absolutely just solve it using it. There is no reason to do hardware. The only reason to do hardware, it's really a problem you can't solve without software. So if you're trying to build self-driving cars, then you're going to have to deal with some sort of hardware. You can't just say, hey, I'm going to build a software and not worry about sensors. And then that's really the, uh, which is what is the problem you want to solve? And that's where it boils down. And when we started working on Matic, uh, like, you know, we very distinctively recall that maybe we need to pause on thinking through this thing and we need to think through what's the future, right? After we build this thing, what's next? And that's when it dawned on us that actually what we're really building is autonomous solutions. So our mission is to enable people, save time and energy through truly autonomous robots. So we see there are so many things we can automate by just working on the robotics, machine learning, and computer vision.